I'm extremely worried about people who go around saying that Putin is bluffing. He is not bluffing. There is no bluff in this man. There is no doubt if you spend any time listening to what he says and watching what he has done, he has he, he has done a marvelous job bringing Russia from a state that was in complete collapse to a state that's now a major competitor uh, for a, a superpower. Well, the current pre- we have a very good president at MIT right now, so I want. But before this new president. These guys were criminals, and I mean criminals. They lied to the Congress. They lied to uh, all kinds of members of the public and and the Congress and and decision makers in the Department of Defense, all to get money for their institution. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I have the great pleasure of having Dr. Theodore Postel with me. Ted Postel is Professor mm-hmm. Emeritus of Science, Technology, and National Security Policy at the Massachusetts Institutes of Technology, the MIT. His expertise is nuclear weapon systems, including submarine warfare, applications of nuclear weapons, and ballistic missiles. Professor Postol is also a contributor to the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, uh, who have for a long time been publishing about the dangers of nuclear war and their opposition to nuclear proliferation. Dr. Postol, Ted, it's a great pleasure having you on. It's a very great pleasure to be uh, to be here. I've watched many of your podcasts and learned a lot from them. Well, thank you very much for that. And I really um, discovered you only recently, but uh, I, I thought immediately when I saw you on another show that I need to ask you to come on here because you're one of these people who, of, of these academics, you know, who do very critical research that can be used for good and for evil and who then also take responsibility for what the outcome of their intellectual journey produces. Could you maybe talk first a little bit about your, well, why you do the research you're doing and uh, why you are engaged in the Bulletin um, of uh, Atomic Scientists? Well, um, I uh, I have uh, throughout my life, frankly, uh, been uh, concerned about violence. Uh, I, it's hard for me to know exactly when it became oriented toward international violence, but certainly uh, it has been an interest in, con- interest in some bizarre way or concern of mine uh, for a very long time, uh, certainly from as certainly as a young adult. When I first arrived at MIT as an undergraduate, I, of course, was essentially totally focused on uh, learning uh, my basic professional tools, developing, uh, you know, an understanding of physics, which is what I was trained in. And uh, as I uh, got more uh, involved at MIT, and also as a graduate student, since I was a graduate student as well as an undergrad, I uh, found, uh, discovered, uh, the uh, uh, many of the faculty had been involved in the Manhattan Project, the, the project where the atomic bomb was built. At that time, these uh, great men and uh, and women uh, were uh, uh, still, you know, fu- you know, active faculty, and uh, uh, several of them uh, had uh, seminars that they started uh, with students, just you know, for reasons of they were committed to helping the next generation understand the issues. And uh, through uh, my experience in these seminars, which were, uh, which was as much personal as intellectual, uh, I uh, began to get uh, more and more concerned about the nuclear weapons problem. I mean, there there was a particular incident I remember in one of the seminars, uh, not an incident so much, but uh, one of the uh, members of the seminar was uh, a very... uh, uh, a very accomplished and brilliant uh, physicist. His name was Philip Morrison, and he was uh, his area of science was uh, basically he was inter- interested in stars. You know, stars were all this 
thermonuclear uh, reactions, nuclear reactions occur. And um, he related a personal story during the seminar that really caught my uh, attention, which was um, he talked about um, arriving at the train station in Hiroshima after the attack. He was one of the people who was sent in to uh, assess the consequences of the attack. And uh, and he was uh, surprised, maybe a, a better word would be uh, shocked, uh, by uh, seeing bodies laid up along uh, in an area where the patterns of the clothing that they had worn had been burnt into their skin. And um, I remember thinking to myself, how surprising it was. I mean, at that point, I knew a little bit about weapons effects because I took it on myself to learn about them. I was a little surprised, not not simply because I was surprised he didn't expect to see that because the uh, thermonuclear, well, the atomic bomb, which was not a thermonuclear weapon, the atomic bomb uh, generates uh, enormously high temperatures, temperatures comparable to the temperature of the interior of the sun, at least for a very short interval of time, and the fireball is is a is an air is a volume of gas atmosphere, which gets superheated into a super hot ball of gas, and then it expands violently outward because it's very hot in the interior. So, because it's hot in the interior, its pressure is very high relative to the exterior. So it expands like a bubble under water until it reaches a, a size where the pressure inside the fireball is equal to the pressure of the atmosphere. And you get this thing called a fireball, a ball of extremely hot air. And when it reaches that uh, point where it's at its maximum size, it's still roughly as it's roughly hotter uh, by about a couple of thousand degrees Celsius than this than the surface of the sun, and so and this is occurring. You know, you're in some cases hundreds of meters from it, or kilometers, or you know, miles, and something that hot is radiating an enormous amount of light and heat, and what happens? is if you have a piece of clothing on, like let's say this shirt, the dark parts of the shirt will tend to absorb the light from the fireball while the light parts of the shirt will reflect it. And if you're at certain distances, the, uh, uh, the pattern of the burn, because some is absorbing and some of the materials absorbing and catching fire or melting if it's an artificial material, and some of the other material is reflecting so it doesn't get so hot, it'll burn the pattern into your skin. Or if this, or if the material is translucent, which occurred in many cases because people were wearing light materials, it was summer, then the pattern of the, of the material will be burnt through their skin, through the material onto their skin. And of course, that's a horrifying thing to see, of course, no question. I mean, if I... Sh uh, I, I do, um, when I lecture on uh, nuclear weapons effects, I do describe that because I think it's important for people for this not to be abstract. I'm not trying, you know, I don't, I don't show picture at the picture at the picture, but I show people what this looks like because I want them to understand that this is a real thing. This is real. And if these things are used in large numbers, there will be a lot of this phenomena expressing itself in all kinds of environments. And what I found uh, somewhat surprising was a man who had obviously um, suffered uh, uh, deep, uh, deep concerns about nuclear weapons from his personal experience in the Manhattan Project and was in a seminar with me decades later, you know, a young guy who, you know, knew nothing. Uh, and, um, and he talks about being surprised at seeing these kinds of uh, horrifying injuries on dead bodies of, of people who were killed at Hiroshima. 
And I said to myself, my goodness, this man, <clears throat> this man studies stars. He studies suns, the, the sun, <clears throat> and all kinds of other kinds of stars in our universe. And he was not prepared to see this phenomenon, which is some, in some way should have been expected. So, so, you... so what, what, I, what I took away from that experience was that these weapons are different from anything even very well-educated people who worked on them understood right from the beginning. And they still are different. They're still not well understood in many ways. We we sometimes or we oftentimes these days hear the comparison of like traditional bombs in megatons and the, the, the impact they have in comparison to the megaton impact of the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it's what you're right. saying is that's that's a stupid comparison. It's wrong. Well, I don't know if it's stupid, but it's wrong. It's 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 based on people's a conventional understanding of what they think an explosive device does. Uh, a typical explosive device, uh, you know, the, the chemical explosives can reach a temperature of maybe 5,000 degrees Kelvin, which is quite hot, and, and but it expands rapidly. But that's not, you know, if you look on the horizon when at night, for example, and there are artillery pieces or bombs dropping, you can sometimes see a blue flash uh, in the in the night sky, it's, usually, it's often red too, and the, that blue flash is the flash of the actual detonating explosive front, which is very hot, five thousand degrees. So it's blue, it's close to blue, but but uh, then it quickly becomes red, and and you have this expanding ball of hot air that presses against the the surrounding air until it finishes, until its uh, pressure is equal to the surrounding air, and then a shock wave is produced by rapid compression of the air surrounding uh, the explosion and then propagates on its own. Now, a nuclear weapon also creates a shock wave in a somewhat similar way, but the shock wave is much less destructive and dangerous than the flash of light that comes from the nuclear explosion because the temperatures that generate the fireball start from tens of millions of degrees not 5000 degrees kelvin and 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 the light and heat is uh, generates uh, fires at great range so for example at hiroshima for basically a mile distance from the um, from the actual fire besides people who were unfortunate enough to be in the line of sight of the fireball there were fires initiated everywhere and the whole city burned in a in a in a firestorm, and the firestorm was somewhat less intense than a firestorm, let's for example, that occurred in uh, in Dresden, because the intensity of the firestorm, once it gets started, is independent of the way it was initiated, whether it was initiated by matches or or nuclear explosions, and the and the um, and the density of uh, combustible material on the ground the density per unit you know the amount per unit area of combustible material was lower than in other cities like in hamburg and dresden so but the firestorm was very very uh, uh you know intense and killed an, an enormous number of people same in Hirish in nagasaki so it, it it was um i mean i i live in the country that where that happened, right? I am in Japan yes. now, and the Japanese, they remember this very deeply. That's also where you have this very deep resentment, not against the Americans, but against nuclear weapons. A very, yes. very deep fear and resentments to this sort of suffering. It's appropriate. Um, you are then engaged in the Bulletin for Atomic Scientists. Um, what were you trying to do? And the story that you told, I suppose, is from the early 70s uh, when you were in Yeah, the it would have been from the yeah, 70s, right. And the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, I think, exists since the 60s. Um, right, right. Uh, what what is the what is the motivation behind the physicists today who engage in this research, in well, the research it, it... that can produce this kind of outcome? It, it it varies. I mean, uh, I uh, wrote regularly for the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists for about forty years. So, and I wrote 
a very large number of articles that were featured on the front page of the journal because they were quite they were considered important and groundbreaking. So I did, you know, my articles were well recognized by the uh, bulletin. Uh, but a few years ago, uh, I decided to withdraw from writing for the bulletin, and that was because the editor there um, uh, uh, promised me that he would re he would have an article I wrote that I knew he was uncomfortable with, uh, and I he promised that I, I I we we had an agreement that he would have it refereed for its technical accuracy because he did not have the technical uh, skills to uh, to understand uh, the accuracy of it. And the reason I wanted it refereed was because I knew he was uncomfortable with it. It was an article about uh, uh, the um, claims that there was a nerve agent attack uh, in, in, in Damascus and, and, the, and that the nerve agent attack was executed by the Syrian government. And I, uh, I had discovered through my research that the evidence pointed to the um, uh, to a an indigenous attack that the nerve agent attack was almost certainly done by uh, rebels against other innocent people in rebel held territories to set up a false flag attack that would then draw the United States into the Syrian conflict and. Um, uh, I've published things outside the bulletin, but anyway, uh, this was not. This still is not the. Uh, what I'll call. I'll. I'll. I'll be a little incorrect here. I call it the political rhetoric, and I will expand on what I mean by political rhetoric in a little while. And um, so, what? What it turned out that uh, after I wrote the article. He did not have it properly reviewed. He told me that it was rejected by the. And I I know what I'm doing. I'm I'm probably the most technically mature person who wrote for the bulletin during that time period. I was writing. I mean, I I did a lot of very advanced technical work that my articles were journalistically constructed, so non-experts could read them. But there was a lot behind anything I wrote. So this didn't sound right to me. And when I pressed him, it turned out that he had not had the articles. He he first claimed that the the so I wanted to see the referee reports because I said you know you you ask for a referee, the referee writes a report and then the author responds to the report. The referee can often say the paper's good, but the referee may have suggestions how to improve the paper. So I was interested in seeing. Well, he couldn't produce the referee reports. Then he claimed that the referee reports were secret, were somehow secret. Well, I said, you can't have referee reports that are secret. The purpose of a referee report is to explain to the author why a paper can be, how a paper can be improved or why a paper should not be published or why there, it's inaccurate. That's the whole purpose of the refereeing process. And he didn't know what to say. So I caught him in an outright lie. And then he started insulting me. And so I said, okay, uh, you if this is the way the bulletin if, this, if these are the scientific standards that the bulletin accepts, count me out. So I no longer write for the bulletin. So your your very um, uh, idealistic understanding of what the bulletin is today, incidentally, uh, 40 years ago, it wasn't this way. So I mean, I've been through 40 years of the bulletin. I've published extensively in it. Today, it's, um, it's a journal... Uh, with people who are, um, they see themselves as liberal do-gooders, which is fine. I'm one too. <laughs> um, but uh, they they don't uh, have a respect for the science that they claim to have. So for example, you can find articles about climate change in the bulletin that are, are complete nonsense no science behind them at all and i actually had that out with the uh, so there was tension between me and this um editor for a couple of years before this event happened because i had said you know you're publishing articles these articles have 
no scientific merit. If you want to publish something on climate change, fine, have it refereed so that it's got technical merit. And uh, of course, he is um, uh, uh, he 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 has this religious idea about uh, the Earth being uh, destroyed, which you know is a concern for all of us. You know, we we all are worried about these phenomena. But he's not interested in doing the hard work to understand what's real and what isn't. And I said, well, if the rest of the bulletin, uh, you know, they have a science advisory committee. I was trying to communicate with the science advisory committee. And, you know, they you get these uh, flippant responses from the uh, the guy who was at the top of it at the time was uh, uh, a guy who later became the uh, president of the American Physical Society. This guy is a total fraud. Doesn't do any work. It's just no science behind him at all. So, so I really uh, must say I I feel the organization has been taken over by a bunch of people who who want to do the right thing, and who um, occasionally do the right thing, but uh, they're not careful. And You're... it's it, it's not a journal that I would I would say it's a journal worth following if you're sophisticated enough to understand what's real and what isn't. You That's are... basically... Go so, ahead, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. I just want to say that you're putting your finger on a very, very important issue here that I didn't expect we would get to, but this is really important to point out because academia and the publishing of knowledge in academia is actually suffering of a similar fate at the moment um, at least in our in our hemispheres, like in Europe and in, in, in the US, um, as journalism in general is, there's people with good intentions whose overriding moral sentiments then kind of suppress an honest investigation into what is really happening on the ground. Right. And we've seen that with the Ukraine war, with the reporting about it. We've seen that with many different instances. We see it how the, the uh, certain parts of the media feel an urge to spin the genocide in Gaza in a certain way or not. And this permeates down to academia at the moment. And I'm quite shocked to know that the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists is actually... Well, it's not, it's that not the whole thing. I mean, there are people mm -hmm. who are responsible among yeah. them, but nobody's willing to stand up and do the right thing. There's no courage. That's another problem. You have but, people when they know better or should know better, they show no courage and uh, and no judgment. So um, you know, uh, you know, I found myself now. Uh, you know, I uh, I, I uh, there was a big scandal. You know, within academic circles, who cares about it? <laughs> but uh, uh, I uh, I uh, I published. It was, I published an article in a journal called Science and Global Security out of Princeton University. I was on the board of Science and Global Security for 30 years. So 30 years since the, since the journal began. Three of the editors of that journal are former students of mine. All right. So they, you know, so I, I mentored all three of these guys. I, I had a very tough time with the article because, um, uh, uh, they were very concerned. Uh, you know, it was it was politically incorrect. So it was uh, it was on uh, another uh, event in Syria where it was alleged that there was a nerve agent attack uh, uh, in in a in a small city called Khan Sheikhoun, which of course resulted in in the last Trump administration firing cruise missiles. Uh, at the Syrian at Damascus in, in you know in punishment for it. And the evidence there showed unambiguously that the nerve agent attack was not had not occurred. The, 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 the explanation for the nerve for the nerve agent attack was simply false. And we could show this. We, we did computer calculations to show that a crater, a crater that they said was the source of a, of a nerve agent release could only have been produced by an explosive device. Uh, basically, a rocket that was a, a, a rocket uh, uh, 
warhead that had hit the ground. We, and we, we did a computer calculation, supercomputer calculation, and we derived the exact shape and dimensions of this crater. This was a very sophisticated calculation we did. And, um, of course, at that time, uh, there was this guy, um, uh, his name is Higgins. He was from this organization called Bellingcat. You know, he was a guy, he knew nothing. Uh, he appears, all, all of the other, I don't know firsthand, but a lot of people who were investigating him, uh, you know, he was funded by the Atlantic Council, which is not an organization that's independent. And um, there were indications that MI6 was involved in funding him. And he knew nothing. I mean, he, he literally had no technical knowledge. And my colleague and I tried to engage with him quite, you know, like scholars. I'm, I'm, I've got no, I'm not trying to prove anything to anybody. I'm trying to understand what the truth is. If I'm wrong, I learn something and I correct what I'm saying. So um, so this guy was running around uh, uh uh, you know, carrying on a campaign against me. So another former student of mine, who's at uh, George Mason University, he gets it in his head that I have lost my sanity, literally. So he's circulating letters behind my back to people in the community saying that I have lost my sanity and that I have, you know, produced this article that has no merit. And although he knows nothing himself, this guy knows nothing. And what happens? These uh, three former students of mine get copies of that letter. Now, if I get a letter saying Pascal is this or that, and, you know, it's all kinds of terrible things about him, whether I know you or not, the first thing I do is I send that letter to you because I say, if you have not seen this letter, if this is not a public letter that you have a chance to respond to and it's being circulated behind your back, um, you have a right to know about it. I'm not participating in stabbing people behind the back. Well, it turns out that all three of my former students were aware of this letter. They had apparently discussed it. And based on discussions they had, they decided to not publish the article, I, which was already in page proofs. It was ready to be, it was going to be published within a week or two. They decided to withdraw publication of, of the article without telling me why. I found out through a colleague what, what had happened, and I confronted them with it and they they sort of say well you know I, you know we, we, is, we're doing the best we can but this is common slander it's just such a simple slander. way of slander. slandering people behind their back well it's, i wrote it, it, i wrote i wrote to the head of the uh, uh wilson uh school and she wrote me back some nonsense about well you know academic freedom crap you know i mean academics have the ability to turn any kind of of absolutely unethical behavior into something that has something to do with freedom of speech. There is nobody who is more an advocate for freedom of speech than me. I risked my career, very early in my career, fighting the U.S. government when it accused a publication of publishing The Secret of the Hydrogen Bomb. I was, a, I was on the laboratory staff of a Department of Energy laboratory and I wrote an affidavit that played a big role in destroying the government's case against this magazine. And they came after me afterwards. They tried to get me fired from the laboratory, the government. So no one's going to tell me that I'm, you know, that I'm, a, you know, I wasn't tenured at that time. I wasn't a tenured member of a faculty at MIT. I was a staff member at Argonne National Laboratory. Don't tell me that you got, you know, you've got, you know, you're tenured and protected. You know, when I was not protected, I did what I thought was right. And here, uh, these three students of mine, they, they say, well, you know, uh, 
we were trying to do our best. And my attitude was, uh, you didn't do your best because, first of all, whether or not you believed what was in this, you know, one of them said, well, we didn't believe it. What do you mean you didn't believe it? You had it. You looked at it. You discussed it. It appeared to be part of the refereeing process because based on this, your discussions, you decided to withdraw publication of the article. So when I so I resigned from the board uh, uh, of uh, uh, of uh, you know I mean I was on the board almost longer than these people were alive, but I wasn't going to. And of course, they wrote me letters imploring me to come back, and I said no, I, I'm not going to be part of an organization that claims to be a serious, independent academic organization based on scholarly standards. And and continue in this role and make believe nothing happened here. This did was they, outright slander. Did they apologize to you? No, they never apologized. They just well, they said they're sorry, but you know, but they they never said we were wrong. Never mm -hmm. said we were wrong. They stuck by their decision, which was fine. If they want to stick by their decision, I have to stick by mine. I'm not going to be part of, you know, and yeah. and how can I consider <clears throat> these students? Friends and colleagues. They're certainly not friends. No friend would do that. I, I, like I said, whether if I if I didn't know you at all, if I only knew your address and I received a letter of this kind, I would send it to you. I would say this is not proper. This is slander, as you say, libel. Like, can we? Talk but this is what I have been subjected. To. You know, it's not. I, I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to cry. <laughs> you know, because I'm a big boy. I'm able to stand up to things but this is the kind of environment that the so-called liberals uh have uh, have produced and if you want i think that is why the democrats lost this election to trump i think we can connect it to the same kind of mentality this is a huge problem, you know, because yeah, I agree. the, the make-believe, the make-believe is that the liberal West has its standards and the standards override any personal opinion of people. And you have a free press that will publish anything that is true and stand up to power. And you have academia, which, which you know, trust the science. The science is yeah. absolute, is infallible, which is a stupid idea in the first place. Right. But, um, uh, but it's also like objective and and you know you just need to understand and then and then society will ru will run like a, like a machine yeah, they... and it's the what's happening currently by the very people who preach this they do the very opposite in a very nasty manner that is now getting so transparent that that a lot of people are getting highly disillusioned with it um, well and... they should be highly disillusioned with it i mean uh the community First of all, I, I have another uh, a friend, actually a friend from literally my undergraduate days, he, and he keeps coming to me and he says, can you help me uh, talk to so-and-so to raise some money because I think scientists are not being listened to? And I say to him every time I get into an argument, I mean, he's a very nice person. He really wants to do the right thing. But I say to him, uh, you know, the scientific community is filled with people who have their agendas and the ethical standards in the scientific community are not what you think. People will say all kinds of things that they basically think they can get away with without doing any real work. I've encountered this throughout my career from the very earliest days. I mean, whether I was, you know, uh, I was, uh, uh, I, I, I was promoting uh, the free. Uh, uh, distribution of information about thermonuclear weapons when the government came in and said the secret of the hydrogen bomb is being released by this pathetic, you know, non-serious article that the government the government was establishing, was trying to establish a precedent for prior restraint of publications. That's what they were doing, basically. It had nothing to do with uh, nuclear secrets. The nuclear secrets were published elsewhere, as I showed in my affidavit to the to the government, which you know caused the case to eventually collapse. But uh, but of course I was attacked for you know where when I was 
submitted this affidavit because I was concerned about protecting the First Amendment, the right to free speech. But instead, I was attacked for not being concerned about the nation's security. Hmm. When in fact, my point was the information was neither classified. Well, I couldn't say it was classified. At that time, I had no clearances. I had clearances later on. But uh, but at that time, I had never done classified work. But I my position was simple. This information is already available to anybody who has the technical training and interest to find it. So how can this be a, a, a publication that simply makes it available to a non-expert community, the people who can't exploit the information? If you're a non-expert, how can you exploit this information? If you're a real expert and you have a weapons program and a nation state behind you, of course, this would be critical information, but this is already known. So how is this a threat to national security? And I was attacked you know, all over the place for being, uh, you know, not concerned about our nation's security. It's amazing. All of these liberals, you know, see themselves as liberals. Hannah Arendt, the, the German philosopher who then spent a lot of her uh, life in, in the US after the Second World War, once said that national security was basically the raison d'etre, the, the reason for the United States to, to conceptualize their, its own existence, right? So it overrides everything, including the First Amendment. And we see that even in, 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 uh, in the House when there's these Senate hearings. I mean, when, oh, they run away. Somebody, when the CIA doesn't want to answer a question, Class they just say national security overrides your right to ask. And everybody runs no away. Nobody presses them. Nobody presses them. And Must they, be secret. They take the right with this one sentence, uh, with these words, to actually override any kind of oversight. But can we maybe for the um, the, the final part of this interview, sure. go into your views about um, the the structure of the security system today when it comes to the weapon systems that we have? We have... We have a non-proliferation treaty that says five nuclear weapon states are fine. You can have this. Uh, chi uh, China, US, Russia, France, and the, the UK, basically the winners of the Second World War. And then we have, um, we know about four more that, ha that have them, uh, which includes uh, no North Korea, Pakistan, India, and Israel, of course. Right. Um, and you... And potentially South Africa, though no longer. No longer. Some right. of them have gi have given it up now. Um, yeah. This this mutual threat with nuclear weapons is this something that you think is um, is destabilizing or actually actually helping us to not pulverize each other? How do you view the the well, the whole of the? Well, it depends on the circumstances. It's both, I think, in some sense. Uh, uh, I ultimately. Uh, I mean, uh, John Mearsheim, who I have nothing but unconstrained respect for, just to be clear. Uh, at one point, John was, I don't know if he would still say this, incidentally, so, but uh, at one point, John was making an argument that uh, everybody should have nuclear weapons because it would stop wars, you know, because people wouldn't use them. Uh, my uh, uh, concern about that argument, my disagreement with it was uh, right from the beginning was the problem is that. Uh, you're you're assuming rational uh, actors in every case, and rational actors who also have complete information. And uh, it's very easy to be in a situation where even if you're a rational actor, you don't have a, the right information or you have misleading information. And uh, and this could lead to the use of nuclear weapons and, and an escalation that's unwanted. So the fact that everybody has nuclear weapons does not necessarily lead to a safer world. So in that sense. I uh, I disagree. I don't I don't want to ascribe this to John because uh, he he may agree with what I'm saying. But that was you know I I don't believe the world is a safer place with everybody having nuclear weapons. On the other hand, um, the fact that both the United States and Russia have very large nuclear arsenals has probably kept this war in Ukraine from escalating into a general war. Probably. Both sides have been very careful about this. I'm extremely worried about people who go around saying that Putin is bluffing. He is not bluffing. 
there is no bluff in this man. He's he's a very deeply thought out uh, strategist. You don't have to like him. You don't have to agree with his you know political his ways of treating political adversaries in Russia. But there is no doubt if you spend any time listening to what he says and watching what he has done, he has he, he has done a marvelous job bringing Russia from a state that was in complete collapse to a state that's now a major competitor uh, for a, a superpower. And, you know, and you can't dismiss a guy who you know from his from just watching him and seeing how he has conducted business over his what well, since two since 1999 or 2000 how he has conducted business this man does not bluff he knows what he's doing he's very knowledgeable and when he says we should all be worried that nuclear weapons could become engaged he means it and and people who just say, well, you know, nuclear war is not so bad, blah, blah, blah. I just find it disturbing to no end. I mean, part of the reason I got part of the reason I got involved in being uh, involved on Internet discussions was I, I felt so worried about it. I started writing letters to people and, and you know, through a series of accidents, people started asking me uh, to give, you know, Internet talks. One of my major objectives was to scare the living daylights out of people with the truth, uh, not scare them with with excessive claims, but the truth. I, I, I just think people are, take it too too lightly. I'm very, very grateful to you for doing that because I my analysis leads to the same point. This utter um, kind of this this failure of analysis of the real danger that we are in. And taking light, making light of uh, a state with nuclear weapons, and at the same time, then then drumming the beats of more war, of all we need to do is to fire more rockets inside Russia in order to make the system yeah. and system collapse. This is this is the height of irresponsibility, and that needs at least to be discussed. <laughs> if this is what kills us, at least we I want to have the discussion about. Well, it. I, I think the I think the academic community. Uh, by and large, there are exceptions. Of course, like John Mearsheimer, mm. he's he's a product of the academic. He's he, he's just a great, great scholar. I mean, there's no question about it. Uh, but when I look at, let's say, this guy Mike McFall, I see him. You know, currently I'm not in. You think I'm in Boston, but I'm actually in California. I have a, my wife and I have a second home. I was at Stanford before I went to MIT, so we kept our place. And uh, so and we we split our time between uh, Palo Alto and uh, and Boston, and um, you know so I see this guy Mike McFall at the, the Center for International Security they have here at Stanford, and he has no knowledge of any kind. He just talks. I got into a discussion with him in January of this year. Avdeevka was in the process of being rolled up by the Russians in this uh, horrifying uh, uh, assault, you know, which, you know, the Russians are fighting a war for their with, for their survival as far as they're concerned. So, you know, it's a horrifying killing of people on all sides. And this guy has a seminar and he doesn't know that this is going on. He doesn't know that Ukraine is in the process of losing the war. So I, I said to him, how can you not know this? He says, what do you expect me to know? Everything? What are you talking about? You're supposed to be a scholar. You go on television advocating for this war. And you don't know that people are dying and what's going on in the war. He says, well, you know, this was the greatest thing of all. He says, well, to me, you know, I really, I, I really want to get rid of Putin. So I said, Mike, how are you going to do that? I mean, you're, you claim to be a policy person. You just told me a policy objective. How are you going to do that? He says, I don't know. I say, so you're spouting a policy objective and you have no idea how to implement it. How do you, th how can you claim that you are a responsible individual? He says, well, you just got to read my books. I said, I've read your stuff. It's, it's, it's nonsense. It's not even bad scholarship. It doesn't even meet the standard of bad scholarship as far as I'm concerned. And this is a guy, he's at Stanford, which is, you know, considered, 
you know, first line university. And, you know, if there were any standards of, of scholarly excellence, he would not be but, on that but, faculty as far as I'm concerned. He, it's he would funny, have no it right to be there. Back, that brings us back to where, where we started or where we were yes. earlier, because we have this problem. We live in this in, uh, information and, and, and um, um, you know, I wouldn't call it knowledge, but information creation environment to which yes. the universities are part of. And one of the incentives is to just nod what, to whatever uh, important guy in a suit and a necktie says, and then and then you will yourself be able to go up that ladder. Now, we do luckily have also in journalism, but also in academia, some people who stand up to this. But if you are a young scientist, if you are in your late Very 20s, difficult. early 30s, you have a real problem, right? It's like, how do you even get up there? So what is your recommendation to young scientists who actually have a spine I, I, I have been and a brain? I have been approached by young scientists, and I'm very sorry to say what tell you what I say to them. I basically say, don't do it. They will destroy you. And and the reason I say that is because I have been through this, and they have tried to destroy me. And I have been very lucky. I mean, I've had a wife who has stood by me through hell and high water. Many people who are whistleblowers, they lose their marriages. And my wife was, she was, she just stood by me. She, God knows why she, she, she loves me so much. I can't figure it out, but she does. And, and she's a person of incredible character, but you know, I was lucky. And then, uh, I, I, you know, I, uh, I escaped the X in, in several situations before I became a tenured member of a faculty was a faculty at a first line institution. The institution came after me, but I had some very good lawyers. And uh and 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 that protected me from this great institution, MIT, which wants to tell you it's a great liberal institution for the truth. No, they're not well, the current we have a very good president at MIT right now. So I want but before this new president, these guys were criminals, and I mean criminals. They lied to the Congress. They lied to uh, all kinds of members of the public and, and the Congress and, and decision makers in the Department of Defense, all to get money for the, their institution. They knew what they were telling people were, was untrue. It wasn't that they were wrong. That's different. You can be wrong. They knew they were saying things that were false in order to get money. And, uh, you know, that was my institution, MIT. With and all they tried of this to get me off the faculty because I called them out on it. With all of this disillusionment about the institutions, still, if there are people who want to oppose it, but they also don't want to ruin their lives, is there a space? Is there a way for silent opposition, you know, for gathering forces while not making yourself a target? Well, I think you first have to get tenured. Mm. That's what I tell people. Get yourself tenured. And also make sure... You know people who know good lawyers because tenure is not enough these days because these these institutions have these contracts and the contracts uh, are hard to break if if you have a good lawyer otherwise they will tell you anything you know uh, uh, i mean my dean my dean let me tell you deborah fitzgerald hi deborah <laughs> uh she wrote me a letter at one point uh you know that Every second sentence in it was a violation of a civil right or or a tenure contract that I had. And she was so stupid and the institution was so lax that when I handed it over to a good lawyer, the lawyer said, they're in trouble. <laughs> Not you. They're in trouble. We got them on almost everything. And, you know, and and so why? What made her and the institution think they could get away with this? Because the average faculty member says, oh, oh, you're doing this to me. I'm afraid. Because academics tend to be cowards. They, they feel they're protected. And, uh, you know, and they shoot off their mouths until they get in a situation where they might have to show some courage. You know, I taught a lot of courses. Uh, I used to teach a bunch of courses that are on weird things, you know. Uh, I, I had this course I called... Um, uh, technology and politics of weapons of mass destruction, you know, <laughs> you know, so, and, uh, you know, and, um, I would, um, 
invariably the course had a very broad mixture of students. It was kind of, it was a lot of fun actually to teach. So I'd have uh, uh, ROTC students in it, you know, reserve officer training, you know, mm -hmm. students who were in the, in the military. And I had uh, 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 people who are interested in political arms control and disarmament and people who are from industry who had worked on weapon systems and were auditing the course to, you know, to get some background and foreign military officers or diplomats even who were at one of these, you know, I was right in the middle of all these great universities in Boston. And, and, you know, it was a real, it was a real zoo. I used to joke about it. It's a real zoo and it was a lot of fun, but one of the jokes I would always make as we got into the course, you know, we get into, I would, you know, first of all, my first statement to the students was, you should not feel reserved about bringing up any question, no matter how politically incorrect you may think it might be. And nobody in this room should ever attack a person who gives up this. That's the only rule you can, you can violate. In other words, you will treat every question that's raised with respect, and you will respond to it with uh, with a reasoned, thoughtful response. If you disagree with it, fine, that's good. But you 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 need to be respectful, and reasoned, and logical, and and bring in facts in your in your discussion. Nothing personal is allowed in these kinds of discussions, you know. And people followed that rule. So at one point, I would always say after we'd been involved in a couple of really hard nosed because the, the, the officers always get into a different fight with the with the people who are politically want to get rid of. It. And, and uh, you know, we it worked very works very well. And, uh, you know, people follow the rules. And then I'd say, well, you know, the only difference between an academic or the major difference between an academic and a soldier is that a soldier would never abandon a defended position without taking his wounded with him. So, <laughs> so that was my view. And, the, and all the students would laugh, including the academics, because the academics understood what I was talking about. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a problem. And there are scholars who stand up. And, you know, some of them are, uh, you know, I know that John Mearsheimer has put up with a lot and, uh, I don't know if he's put up with more than me or less than me or and I know others who have put up with a lot, but you know. I mean only through only through um secondhand um information I was told that the the backlash and the attacks he got for his book, two thousand six book on uh the, the lobby, the Jewish lobby was Oh immense. I, I knew that immense. was happening. Yeah, so, I could see that. Uh, I knew it was he... happening. Yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. In the sense, you know, the idea that academia is independent of daily politics is just one more of these fictions that also needs to be dismantled for the students and the people who get into it. Because it is it is a cruel world if you actually have a, um, a, a conscience that you want to, to protect. Well, students make a critical mistake. I, I I know this because I made the mistake as a student. You see these uh, people who you regard correctly or not, in some cases it is correct, correctly or not, as towering intellects in their particular professions. Doesn't mean they're towering intellects in other things. In other words, uh, because you're a physicist doesn't mean you know anything about politics, for example. A lot of these guys think they're, you know, if the world, if they were in charge of the world, it would be lot better nonsense probably be worse so but uh but as a student you tend to mix up the fact that some of these people are truly gigantic intellects in their particular fields with being morally superior and the moral superiority is not there mm -hmm. sometimes it's there sometimes not but more than more than not it's not there because arrogance plays a big role. When people are arrogant, they do not listen to alternative views. They do not listen to alternative informa information that they haven't learned about. I mean, if you want to look at a total, a, a functional idiot, 
let me just go to a functional idiot. Look at Anthony Blinken. All right, now, Mr. Blinken, there's no doubt that he's an intellect. He can write. Uh, he can speak with, you know, real gravity if you want to, you know, change your voice and make some, you know, sound like you're really important. He can do those things, but um, he he can't he can't make a, a, a policy decision that's anything but negative throughout his entire tenure as as secretary of state he has done if i were if my objective was to destroy the the credibility of the united states as strongly as i possibly could if that were my objective i would have pretty much tried to do what blinken has done i mean he's just everything he's everything he's done is screwed up now how is that possible you say the man is not stupid in the in the simple in the simple definition of what intelligence is but if he's so arrogant and if he ha and if he has the character arrogance is a character flaw for example john mearsheim is a brilliant man but he does not have the character flaw of being arrogant if you talk to him and you bring up a question that he hasn't considered he will immediately respond to it he will not say oh you know, blah, 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 you know, you, you know, get angry at you. You will carry on a discussion. Yes. If you want to call it a debate, that's okay too. It's a, it's a debate that's aimed at, at deepening the common understanding of the problem you're debating, you're discussing. He's not interested in winning it. He's interested in increasing the general understanding of the subject. And so I consider him a mensch, you know, he's a serious guy. And uh, but when you're, um, you know, Mike McFall, you know, it's a joke. You can't talk to him. The first thing he says to you is, oh, you're calling me stupid. And I say, no, I'm not calling. I, I actually went around with it. He says to me, you're calling me stupid. I said, I never said that, Mike. I've never called you stupid. What I am saying is you're immoral. You are immoral because you are advocating things that are getting people killed and you have no, you have not even done the minimum to understand what you are doing and the negative consequences of what you're doing. And to me, that's immoral. It's just that simple. But I never, I never called you stupid. Oh, he says you're calling me. It's, it's just so pathetic. It's so infantile. But it's not uncommon. It's not uncommon at all. I'm, I'm not sorry. I'm, you know. Yeah. No. No. I. Uh... I, I I completely think you you're you're right, and it has something also to do with the fact that people who are not very intelligent lack the faculty to understand that they're not, <laughs> and then they yeah. they carry yeah, forward, they, can they be carry a, on. It's a character thing. Intelligence is an extraordinarily multifaceted uh, mm -hmm. thing. I mean, uh, I believe I believe I don't know if this is true. Uh, I haven't debated this carefully enough with some of my friends who are philosophers but i i have this belief that if you're absolutely sure of yourself there's something wrong yeah you should always be saying is am i really right you're always looking for the possibility even when you you think you are right i mean uh, there are lots and of things i really think i understand but and entertain the counterfactual what if i'm yeah. wrong just what if i'm wrong and right. then entertain the thought and then that that itself will help you to understand whether you want to stay on that track or whether you want to actually go and talk absolutely to about absolutely but people are interested in making their careers hmm. on all kinds of uh, silly uh, ideas because a lot of people don't have very good. I mean, I remember one student. They wanted to do a thesis on the uh, uh, the um, what was it? The architecture of military bases it was supposed to be. You know, well, I, you know, I, I didn't. I wasn't a participant in that project. But I said, well, you know, I can um, I can understand why it might have some interest, but it doesn't strike me as a very profound subject. It, it's 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 an esoteric subject. But just because it's esoteric does not mean it's profound. People mix that up. Mm. There can be esoteric questions you ask that are deep and profound, but there can also be esoteric questions you ask that don't really matter. 
in the greater scheme of the intellectual structure of our understanding of the world. And, uh, you know, uh, okay, if you want to do that, oh, you know, maybe it, it, maybe something will come up hmm. in your in intellectual investigation that turns out to be deeply, uh, uh, you know, meaningful. And I'm not against it, but I think uh, there is a difference between esoteric trivia and uh, and 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 something that looks esoteric, but it's it, it has deep meaning and consequences for the greater greater knowledge and yeah, understanding. And and there's there's a point to make here for also like a preliminary study or just also like quest asking that question in order to get the student to to actually figure it out even more right yeah. of why it is important um Ted, I really enjoyed this conversation very much. Oh. We've reached the one hour mark and I do hope we we can talk again because this problem I'll be happy of, to talk again. This problem <laughs> of academia is is is, is really exist uh, important it's right a now. Serious it's getting problem. worse and it gets worse everywhere. It gets worse in Germany, it gets worse in in Eastern Europe. Um I don't know about Russia and the BRICS. I do think yeah. that outside of the West actually we might have some hope left, but in the West it's getting it's getting worse. Um, I'm run, I'm running out of boards to resign from though. <laughs> <laughs> You're free. I mean, I'm free. Yeah. Enjoy the freedom, and and I, we will I talk again. Um, Ted, if people want to follow your writing, do you still publish somewhere regularly where people can sign up to? I've been basically uh, writing. Uh, I, I've done some a couple of short things for um, uh, the Quincy Institute. Uh, they have this uh, responsible statecraft. This responsible statecraft did a couple of things for them, but uh, I've been concentrating mostly on uh, on on preparing for podcasts. To be honest with you, because uh, I have found that, uh, to my great surprise, uh, uh, this is an honest statement I'm making. To my great surprise, people are interested in what I have to say. I I actually, well, you know, when you wrote me, I said I'm not sure I have much to say. I think, you know, I think you have those communications from me. So, you know, it's other people. I, I just, I'm trying to be, be helpful. I'm glad to know people are interested in these issues because they are very important as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, I don't have an outlet for that. You know, what, what, what am I write for an educational journal where five other people read it? It's better Sub, to talk. Substack. Publish your own Substack. Publish yourself. And make it clear that this is your opinion and this is your analysis and then let people choose whether they want it or not. And that's well, a way forward too. And by the way, you know, I keep repeating this, but what the one thing that being gay taught me is that not telling others about it doesn't make it better. So by the fact of like letting others know that we are there and that we disagree and that we are not okay with the wave that's engulfing us, that helps a little bit, little by little, and you, yes. you build little by little. Yeah. yeah. So well, thank you for your intellectual honesty. Thank you for your time, Ted Postel. Well, I look forward to talking Ted again. Postel. If if you if you choose to waste another hour with me, we will. We will. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Uh,